walking in this series um, called Returning and Rebuilding, going through the book of Nehemiah. We're again in chapter 6, and last week you've seen in chapter 6 that Nehemiah and his crew has basically rebuilt the wall. They're just waiting to uh, hang the gates, and then all of a sudden, again, the enemy shows up. Uh, wanting to distract from the ultimate mission that God had put on Nehemiah's heart. And I took some time last week just to really focus on this this fact that we are in a battle, right? So it's February. Uh, we have COVID regulations that we're dealing with constantly. And uh, it snowed. So some of us today looked at the window and we debated, should I even go to church? Should I even attempt to go out there in this crazy weather even though it's snow and uh, some of us we got here right and we're excited to be here some of us are watching online today and we're excited for what God has to say to us but I want to remind us all the time that we're on a battlefield that you came in here today and the reality is you're in a fight that the flesh is fighting against you. The world is warring against you. And by the world, I don't mean the people. I mean the philosophies that would go against Scripture. And then we have Satan and demons. And uh, you come into a spot like this, and here's what's going to already happen. So I've, I've been praying, and, uh, and the Spirit of God just put this on my heart in the morning, how he just let people know that the enemy is... An accuser, okay? So you walk in here today, and I need you to hear this. Satan is accusing you. Some of you come in here and you're like, I don't think I'm that good of a Christian because I did this and I have this in my past. Whatever it is, he is accusing you. So I'm going to preach today. You're going to hear some things, and some of you are going to go, Oh no, I think he's directing that at me. Some of you are going to take it personally. Uh, if we were being honest, for many of you in this room, I don't really know your personal life. You have haven't opened it up and I don't preach that way right like my goal in the week isn't to try to visit you all and go what are you really battling with and fighting with so that way I can come up here on Sunday morning and expose it so I'm going to say some things today and some of you are going to go oh how does he know me I don't but the Spirit of God knows you the Spirit of God is drawing some things out of your heart out of your life so you're not here by accident you're not here because so-and-so whatever it is invited you or you just popped in you are here because the Spirit of God has something to say to you and God wants to get your attention okay so don't feel accused I'm not here to beat you up but here's the reality Satan has these schemes, these plans that he plots. He's done it with Nehemiah. He'll do it with us. So the evidence that is this, we're on a battlefield. So the soldier on the battlefield has to be ready. He needs to, and she needs to understand the strength of the enemy. And uh, it's seen in how we prepare ourselves if we take the enemy serious. Okay? Okay. So think about this spiritually. That's why in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul launches into the most famous spiritual warfare exhortation in the Bible. And the first thing he says about this in verses 10 and 11 of Ephesians 6, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against what? The schemes of the devil. Did you hear what he said? that you may be able to stand, stand against the schemes of the devil. Uh, like any other war, there will be no defeating the spiritual enemy if we do not have the right equipment. We're, we got to look at this. Wars that are raged carelessly are wars that are lost. Um, Protective armor and offensive weapons matter. So Paul gives us in Ephesians six fourteen to 17 some things. He says, you should put on the helmet of salvation. 
You should put on the belt of truth. You should wear the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, meaning the word of God. And all he's doing is he's bringing us back to who we are in Christ. Like if you are found in Christ, you have the helmet of salvation. Your life is girded by the belt of truth. Like you have truth in your life to fight against the lies of Satan. Like this is a war over what is real. We need to get this because our world doesn't believe Satan is real. Demons are real. Our world says, no, they're not real. It's just a religious thing. No, the enemy center point church is real. Like we're on a battlefield and some of us, we're just chilling. We're kicking back. We're giving our hearts to worldly things. We're giving our hearts to things that are robbing us of what true joy really is. Um, one of the things, and, and this is, this is where, where it goes, like we, we uh, have things in our life that distract us all the time. And uh, one of the rarest people to go to a church service today is a male, age 18 to 30, okay? When they show up, we're at a point where it's almost like a miracle. Uh, that's the culture we live in. Like, and 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 I've I've pastored long enough in the church, and and it's for the most part like males are rare that age group. Uh, however, and this is where Satan wants to get you. I'll, I'll just let you know I'm not against video games. Uh, however, uh, males 18 to 30 give their heart to video games. I'm just stating stuff. Now, Satan wants to go, see, gotcha, he's at you, he's going to preach now, here you go. And he wants you to throw, no, Satan wouldn't say that, but you're going to go, oh no, is he going to tell me to throw out my, my video game machine? Is he going to say, like, burn the Xbox or burn the PlayStation? And yes, he is, because that, no, of course I'm not. What I'm going to say is this, on average, get this, back in 2019, on average, in North America, video games were played 4.7 to 5.6 hours per week, okay? Now, in 2020, that's gone up to 8.7 hours to 10 hours a week, on average. But if we were being honest, for the most part, some of us are like, yeah, I play that in a day. Uh, there are more men age 18 and 30 fighting a war, playing Call of Duty, than who are in a church giving up their life for the mission of Jesus. Like there are people who will die today without Christ and go to a place called hell. It's going to happen. We're in this dark battle, this big battle. So I'm not saying burn your machine. All I'm saying is like, think about this. Are you on mission for Jesus? Are you involved? Because you're on a battlefield. And the enemy's got a lot of people just chilling on the battlefield. Like, hey, I received Christ. I said a prayer when I was a kid. You know, I show up at church every now and then. And from time to time, you know, I throw some money into the offering. Me, me and Jesus are good. And meanwhile, Satan's just robbing from us. He's destroying us. He's taking us down. And it should not be happening because of who we are in Christ. So, so all we got to do is look around our world, just take, and, and we've done this, and just see the destruction that it wreaks. When humans are deluded over what's real, they think and they do terrible, unspeakable evil, individually and collectively. Like, we don't have to look at our broken world long to go, yeah, this is a mess. It's a big mass. The enemy's real. Just take a careful look and see the brokenness. Broken homes, broken relationships, disease, horrible, sinful, evil sins committed against people that we commit, that are committed against us. Like, think about the brokenness of our world. Center point, what you, what you are seeing are the outcomes of Satan's schemes, okay? So, in our culture, we've dismissed things like demonic possession. The reality is, there are people in our world who are possessed. 
we're, we're missing things like spiritual oppression. That when I'm walking with Jesus, the enemy is trying to oppress me. He's standing against me. He doesn't want me to succeed in my walk with Christ. This is what he wants to do to you. He wants to rob you. Those you love, he wants to destroy them. And you know that because you know the thoughts that go through your own mind because you're totally depraved. D- deprived. Just the total depravity of sin. Sin is real, and we even know that in our own hearts. We all have this bend to selfishness. We all have this want to serve ourselves, to make much of ourselves. And you can stand against these schemes, though. That's the good news today. So even though the enemy's real, even though he's attacking, hear me on this, the battle has been won. Jesus, the master, commander, the chief, went and fought the battle, destroyed the enemy. So today, if you are found in Christ, you are on a battlefield, but you are a victor. Yeah, you might have some things tripping you up. You might have some things holding you back. But in Christ, you are, and we sang about it, set free. He's won. He's fought. So, why are we giving Satan footholds in our lives? Why? Are we giving our heart to the things of the world? See, you can actually stand against these schemes. Sin doesn't have to reign in our lives. And the more that we do this, the more that we defeat our enemy and drive him back, the more we see how amazing Jesus really is. The more we see that this battle, it's very serious. And and here's the thing. The enemy doesn't let up. So you woke up today battle. You'll wake up tomorrow by God's grace, battle. You will constantly be on the battlefield. And here's what Paul is saying. You you don't wrestle against lightweights. Like this isn't sports entertainment. Like this battle hasn't been planned. Like here's what you're going to do. And we can be very dramatic in that. But the reality is uh, Satan is not a lightweight. It's not someone to mess around with. The world is not something to play around with. And our flesh, oh, it's so, like, isn't it hard, like, the temptations of the flesh? Like, tomorrow, I I was like, man, like, this new year has been giving me a hard time in my, like, eating, my diet plan and all that. Anybody there? Anybody went new year? Like, I'm going to eat healthy? And you're like, yeah, it's February 21st. That's not going too well. (laughs) So I'm like, man, I need to do something. So this week, I was like, I'm just going to make a group. We're going to try to keep each other accountable. And we're going to try to do this, eat healthy, stay uh, fit, do things like that. And uh, if I don't have a plan, I already know I'll lose. So spiritually speaking, do you have a plan? See, Nehemiah is in chapter 6. He's like, okay, the plan is rebuild the wall. We need to rebuild it. It's almost done. And then Sambalot shows up and says, hey, come, come meet with us. And Nehemiah's like, no, I need to finish the wall. And the enemy just keeps coming. And here's the reality of this. Paul describes our foes this way. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Like, did you stop? To think today, I am fighting the cosmic powers of darkness. <laughs> I, I'll be honest, some days I wake up, I'm like, I just need coffee. I just want coffee. And, and the Bible just said, like, you got demonic forces that are after you. Like the cosmic powers. This is what's happening today. And to just take that enemy lightly would be a mistake. Like, did you ever try to take some territory from the cosmic powers? Did you ever just go, all right, this week I am going to read my Bible. I'm going to set my alarm. I'm going to get up and I'm going to read. And then you go to do it and you're like, I slept through my alarm. So, Uh, If you have a phone like mine and you check out my alarm features, I have alarm features from 4 a.m. to 9. (laughs) Because I'm in a battle, right? 
And, and some of those alarms, I'm like, how did I sleep through that one? I slept through that one. Oh, that one, I totally snoozed that one. And then by the end of it, I'm like, I'm just turning them all off. Like, you set out on stuff, like, I'm going to read, I'm going to pray, I'm going to get to church, and, and all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to go to church next week, and it snows, and you're like, I can't go to church. <laughs> the enemy's real, Center Point. He's trying to stop you. He's trying to rob you. And here's the good news if you are found in Christ. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So you can have victory. You can walk in victory. You just need to stand your ground. You need to stand firm against the enemy. See, the thing that we need to realize, center point, is that uh, Satan, de demons, they're just scared to death of God. They've already lost. Do you know what else terrifies them? A spirit-empowered person. A Christian who is tracking with God. And they're like, oh, we got to take notice. We need to try to step in here. We need to stop some things. See, battles are intense affairs. But if we take the battle seriously and we use divine equipment that God provides, then we will be able to stand against the schemes of the evil one in that day. Therefore, Paul says, take up the whole armor of God, and having done all, stand firm. Uh, so here's what you do. Stand your ground. Don't yield an inch. More than that, press your enemy back. Take his ground and fight. So here, here's what I'm asking us, like Nehemiah. Don't get distracted by the enemy because if the enemy can't distract you, here's what he'll do. He'll try to discourage you. Okay? So you don't get distracted. Now this heads to the second thing about Nehemiah and, and Satan's scheme. And it's basically his second scheme is innuendo. Uh, last week we talked about intrigue. This week we'll look at this and a few others. But after four frustrated attempts to get Nehemiah to a meeting where they could ambush him, he turns it down over and over. He doesn't go. So now Sambalot has another plan. He, he just starts rumors. He, he writes a public letter. So he writes a letter accusing Nehemiah that he's hired prophets to proclaim that Nehemiah wants to be king. Uh, in that day, a uh, these letters should have been sealed, so they shouldn't have been read, right? It's sort of like today, if you write a letter to someone or an email to someone and you address it to them, who is that letter for? Simple, I asked you an easy question. For them. But we live in a day where we share that stuff and we forward the email and all of a sudden we start spreading rumors and slander. And this is sort of the enemy's next move on Nehemiah. So here's what Satan does. He spreads false slanderous rumors against people who are on mission for Jesus. So if you're on mission for Jesus, even in the church, like, let's just be real. Sometimes people who are passionate about the things of Christ... Uh, some of us get annoyed with them, right? Like, uh, let's just say Susie, she loves scripture. She reads scripture. And when you're around Susie, she's like, oh, man, God's so good. I feel so blessed. And you're like, oh, Susie, stop reading your Bible. You're making me feel bad. Like, that's sort of how our hearts go. And, and it's in the church culture, too, where we should actually be, like, grateful for Susie's who read Scripture, who pray for us, who are there uh, through the good seasons, the hard seasons. And what happens is when you're on mission, you'll always get kicked back. From Satan, and he starts it with rumors and slanderous attacks. He does this open letter, and uh, it's so it's so tempting, right? You get a good rumor, and you're like, "Ooh, is that real? I don't know, but it's really good." And then all it takes is one rumor with one gossip to spread. All right, so we're we're wearing masks today because of uh, COVID-19 that spreads. However, gossip, I'd tell you, is even more devastating. It just spreads and spreads and spreads, and rumors come. So Proverbs 13, verse 3 says this, He who guards his lips guards his life, but he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. If some random person now gossips about us, we're not shocked. Like, that's secular culture. Like, that's, 
discourse in, in our day. That's how people communicate. They, they do that. But when believers, those who claim Christ, uh, spread rumors, it takes on another category since it amounts to things like this. Uh, it's, if I am found in Christ, I am your brother or I am your sister. And if I slander, gossip, spread a rumor about you, hear me on this, I'm basically throwing you under the bus. But yet the Bible would say things like this. You're my friend. What a great friend, right? Ever have those friends? They're like, we're there for you. We support you. And uh, the first rumor they hear about you, they believe and run away from you. And they're your Christian brother or sister. Or uh, how about this? Uh, we've been saved into the body of believers. So, so if we slander, if we spread rumors about people in the body of Christ, who are we hurting? We're hurting ourselves. We're hurting the mission of Christ. And I need you to see this is what the enemy does. He moves to this area where he wants gossip and slander to be the thing you hold on to. And in the church, where we have gone is, and Paul Tripp puts it this way, judgment is easier than mercy. So we'd rather judge in the church than extend mercy. We'd rather... Uh, okay. We've all been here, right? You meet someone for the first time. And in our pride, we're like, I, I got them figured out. <laughs> and then we get to know them. And we're like, wow. They're nothing like I thought they were. Like, in the church, we are famous for judging people. When we should be marked by mercy, we sang about it, drowning in mercy sea. Wouldn't it be amazing if no matter who came into Centerpoint Church or into our local churches, we didn't judge them, but we extended mercy to them? Don't you think people would be like, wow, that, I went to this church and, and they just loved on me. They didn't beat me up. They didn't make me feel shameful. They didn't judge me. They loved me. Now, there's a difference between challenge and judging, right? So judging is, is, is sinful in the way of if I'm going to judge your heart, but the reality is the challenge is we all have, if we walk with Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit, and that can be examined. So if you're claiming Christ, yeah, people should be able to examine the fruit of your life. They should be able to go, yeah, that person, they, they follow Jesus. It's evident. So we do stand out in that way, but the Christian church needs to be more about mercy, not spreading rumors, not spreading gossip. And a few weeks ago, I preached about that. I won't get into it very deeply, but I just go, uh, what happens here is they can't distract Nehemiah, so now they head to his character. So any leader, any person on mission will have rumors about them. So uh, someday I was like, man, I, I think I'd like maybe to write a book on like, and call it the rumor mill. Because uh, over 11 years at Centerpoint, uh, here's some rumors that have gotten back to me. Uh, I have w been wanting to lead Centerpoint to be an emerging church, meaning I downplay the atonement of Jesus Christ. I don't believe that he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. That I don't preach the gospel, that I don't challenge people to receive Jesus as Savior, that I'm a dictator I'm trying to build my own empire, that I'm a crazy charismatic and I'm trying to get everyone to speak in tongues. And I stand here today and I don't speak in tongues, so I don't know how I could do it. But anyways, that's out there in the rumor mill. That I don't believe that God can heal, that I believe there is no heaven, that I believe there is no hell, that I believe everyone's going to heaven, that I hate hymns, that I'll never allow them to be sung at center point, that I hate contemporary music, and I'll not allow it to be sung at center point. The truth is, if you just ask me, I hate country music. And uh, I've even allowed that to be sung at center point. So uh, I got, I'm leading people to hell because I don't preach from the King James Version of the Bible. I'm trying to be a pop star because I have spiked hair and wear ripped jeans. I'm ego driven because I enjoy working out. I've heard that I'm in self-preservation mode and the person who said that feels bad for me. I've heard that I've committed bank fraud, that I've been... Uh, 
change the vision of Center Point Church. That I didn't inform people that we were a multi-site church, even though Surf Charlottetown has been around since 2013. I've sold drunk. Uh, I've, I've sold drugs out of the trunk of my car. I want to look the best, sound the best, and attract the most, all at the absolute co cost of no longer being the church. That's just a little bit. So, rumors will go when you're on mission. All right? So if you are following Jesus, if you are loving Jesus. Now, if you sat with me and you asked me, hey, Howie, what's, what's, what's your vision for Center Point Church? I'd tell you this. I'd love to see churches in Monarchy, Charlottetown, and Summerside, and throughout wherever else God calls us, be it in Puerto Rico or wherever that is, I just want to see the gospel go forward. My heart is that lost people come to know Jesus. That's my heart. So at the end of the day, when I die and I stand before Jesus, I want to be able to stand there and go, I obeyed your mission. Now, not everyone likes the mission of going because we live in a culture that loves comfort. So sing songs that make me feel good. Preach messages that make me feel good. Like that's the culture we live in. So not everyone who says something about someone is true. So just so you know, rumors can affect like i remember when i started center point church i had four ladies who wouldn't come because they really believed i sold drugs and i'm like that's craziness like so so you can't let rumors stop you on the mission of god so in your life when you're getting closer to jesus and people are seeing you change they're going to say things about you they're going to hold things do what nehemiah did I have no time for that. I'm on mission. I got to keep going. I got to keep moving forward. See, uh, rumors are like germs. It's just a virus that spreads. So Nehemiah is not giving into it. So how does he respond to it? He actually responds to it with truth and with prayer. Uh, so he here's what we must do. We must hold to God's truth. So much so that even uh, if... if if I know to disobey God, I'll have people's favor. I got to obey God. We got to hold to truth in our life. Uh, we must pray for God's wisdom. We must even go, is it even wise to respond against false accusations? Like all those things I read to you and those rumors, if I fought every one of those, I'd be exhausted. I wouldn't be in ministry today. But I know God has called me to one thing, to preach the gospel. That's what he's called me to. And I need to do that. And I'll do that until God says, all right, you're done. Let's go. Until that day, we need to stay to our mission. What's the mission of the church? Please, it's so easy. Go, 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 go. So we need to stay to that mission center point. The mission of the church is to go where? Into all the world. So we want to spread the gospel in all the world. And here, Sambalot's trying, trying his best to distract uh, Nehemiah. Uh, and Nehemiah doesn't give in. Scheme number three, if, if the uh, intrigue, innuendo doesn't work, he uses intimidation. Here's what I mean. Satan uses religious people to try to scare us into wrong behavior. Okay? So in all our churches, we have people who would be religious, meaning church to them is something they go to, not something they are. Like the Bible says we are the church. So the church isn't an activity we go to. The church is a people that's on mission. This is a gathering we come to, but we're the church in the gathering. But throughout the week, we still represent Jesus. So now the enemy here combines deception with intimidation and fear in verses 10 to 14 of Nehemiah 6. So a prophet named Shemaiah is confined at home. We don't know if he was ill or if he was doing this as a prophetic drama. Because sometimes in the Old Testament, the prophets were very dramatic. I don't know if you know, but a lot of preachers are very dramatic. <laughs> That's the story of my life. I live drama. And uh, in the Old Testament, some prophets had some unusual callings. The one prophet, God's like, yeah, I want you to cook your food today in the street, but I want you to use poop. So cook it over poop. <laughs> and you're like, That's in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Bible. 
But I thought the Bible was boring and not, that's in the Bible. He also told, remember a few weeks ago, another prophet, I want you to walk around naked for three years. And uh, we go, that's not the call today, but that Old Testament prophet obeyed God and he did that. And, and here's the thing, we don't know if Shemaiah was ill or if he was just in his home confined because he was acting out this prophecy. But in verse 14, we see Here's our verse 10. He says this, for they are coming to kill you and they're coming to kill you at night. He's saying to Nehemiah, hey, come to the temple. Come, we'll stay there. You'll be in the temple. They can't kill you. However, Nehemiah perceives to the Holy Spirit that this prophet is actually a false prophet. He's hired by Sambalot and Tobiah. And uh, a true prophet would never go against God's word. So Nehemiah picks up on it. He says, I'm not listening to you. I'm not obeying it. And non-priests could not go into the temple in that way uh, because it would break the law of the day. So uh, the prophet is telling him, come to do something that would go against God's law. Nehemiah catches on. It's a scare tactic. Everyone... Well, we'll do this, right? So, so some of you, it's sort of like this in your life. Uh, uh, if you don't go to that party, nobody will like you. Scare tactic. If you don't come and, you know, get drunk with us and do drugs, uh, we, they'll never invite you again. You'll have no friends. All the time, the enemy wants to use scare tactics. All the time. So here's what Nehemiah does. He reacts to this intimidation with fearless obedience and prayer. Should a man like me flee, verse 11, and could one such as I go into the temple to save his life, I will not go. I love Nehemiah. He didn't perceive until this point that God had not sent Shemaiah, so now he gets that. Uh, So hear me on this. It is always right to obey God's word no matter what the threatened consequences are. If God's word is confirming it in obedience, you obey it. It's always right. You can mark that down. It's always right to obey God's word. But Howie, what if people don't like it? It is always right to obey God's word. But Howie, what if I lose some friends? It is always right to obey God's word. But Howie, what if I have to give up some of these things in my life that I don't want to give up? It is always right to obey God's word. It is always wrong to disobey God's word, even if it looks like your disobedience will gain you something good. It's so easy to disobey and win favor than to stand and obey and lose people. But at the end of the day, church, you will stand before God. And God will hold us to our obedience. You may not be celebrated here for your obedience, but trust me, you'll be celebrated up in heaven. I I really believe that as we walk with Jesus and we walk in obedience, he rejoices. Uh, Zephaniah 317. uh, I love that verse because it talks about like, like God singing over us. Oh, but Howie, what if I mess up? What if my life isn't marked by that right now? That you're even considering that and asking that, that's good news. Don't beat yourself up with guilt. Don't beat yourself up with shame. Just draw closer to God. And that stuff will become dimmer and dimmer in your life. And you will start to obey with joy, with zeal, with passion. It is always right to obey God's word. And here's what what happens in our church. God just uses religious people to discourage those on mission. Uh, I've had people, and it's sad to say this, but I've had people threaten to stop tithing to the church if I didn't do what they wanted or if I didn't do what they say. So people would say things like this to me all the time. I'm going to stop tithing. What are you going to do when there's no money to do that? What are you going to do when there's no money for you to get paid? And I'm just simply saying, like, are we reading our Bibles, any of us? God provides for all our needs. Like, I don't own anything I have, biblically speaking. It's God's. I just manage it. Like, Your house is not your house. Your car is not your car. That's God's. And he's saying, I gave it to you. 
manage it, do it well. And if you do it well, then we might receive blessing from God where we have resources to do a whole lot. So I'm like, I stand here today. I'm like, man, I really believe Centerpoint Church could have churches in Montague, Charlottetown, and Summerside, and where else God puts on our hearts. I just believe it. How's that going to happen? God knows. He has the resources. He'll take care of it. We got to be on mission. But when we're on mission, religious people try to intimidate us to stop it. Because here's what happens in our churches. When God starts to move and do a work, new people show up. I'll never forget pastoring this church where we hardly got visitors. It was almost like if a new person showed up, I was like, don't be super weird. <laughs> Like, I grew up in that culture. Like, if you were new, imagine, you might be new today, but here's what we did to new people in the 80s. They'd show up, and we'd sing them a song. We would get them to stand. Could you imagine? Today, you're new, and I go, stand to your feet. <laughs> and then I start going, there's a welcome here. There's a welcome here. There's a Christian welcome here. Hallelujah. There's a welcome here. There's a welcome here. There's a Christian welcome here. You'd be like, who's that idiot? Why can't he leave me alone? Why do Christians have to make it so awkward? Not only that, if it was your birthday, we'd bring you a mini little church building that was a piggy bank, and you would have to put your age in quarters and dimes and nickels in that church. And you might not have come prepared, so we had people like dropping fives and tens. <laughs> Good way to get the offering up, but anyways, <laughs> that's just weird. Oh, center point. Religious people are so weird. Like, be who God created you to be and walk in obedience and honor Him and just be that person. When people look at you and they go, why are you different? It's not because I'm so good. I'm so awesome. It's Jesus changed me. I just understand His grace and I want to live for His glory. Satan lost the battle, but he didn't give up. So here's the fourth thing that Satan does. He uh, sends people within the midst of the church. So that's, that's our fourth point, all right? He, if he can't distract you, if he can't discourage you, he'll send people onto your path who will try to push you away, who will try to take you away. Uh, so even in the church, there are people who come that are actually sent by the enemy. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share this. When I first started Centerpoint Church, we had a lady coming to our church for three months. She wanted to meet with me, so she met with me in my home. And I'll never forget this day because this is the ploy of the enemy. And uh, she sat in my living room and she went on to tell me that I had to teach her everything about preaching and teaching because she can do it better than I can because she has a yellow glow around her body and I had a blue glow. But the yellow glow was better than the blue glow. And I sat there and I heard her and she kept talking. And uh, I just kept being more and more aware like, this is not even her. This is actually Satan. Demonic. This is where this is coming from. And she's like, here's what you need to do. We need to get rid of the Bible, and you need to introduce me on Sunday mornings to come up front. And I said to her, I need you to do one thing right now. I need you to get out of my house and never come back to Centerpoint Church because I'm representing Jesus. And as soon as I said Jesus, she stood up, she yelled at me, and she's like, never say his name again. And she marched out of my house, and I haven't seen her since. Demonic forces are real. Satan sends people all the time into our churches to disrupt it, to get it off mission. It's going to happen, church. It's already happened. This is what the enemy does. So, 
if we know the enemy's real, if we know that he tries to send people into the church, because here's what happens, Tobiah eventually sleeping in the temple area. He, he's there. He's showing up. The enemy of Nehemiah is literally there. So this section now gives us three practical lessons uh, in the last few verses of Nehemiah 6. Do not expect perfection in the Christian work. Do not expect perfection in your personal walk with Jesus. Can I free you of that? Some of you didn't read the Bible every day this week, right? Jesus isn't expecting perfection. Some of you, you haven't really prayed a whole lot. But here's what we want to do. We want to give our best. So we can't expect perfection. But man, I am going to continue to set my alarm so I wake up to read scripture. I am going to continue coming to church so I can be part of the body. I am going to continue to give him my time, my resources, my treasure for the glory of Jesus. I'm going to do this. I'm going to work at that. Not to earn his favor, not to earn his love, because the gospel already says, I've already earned his favor. I've already learned, uh, earn, earned his love because of Christ and what Christ has done. I don't have to work to earn that. Jesus has done everything. But man, I want to be so close to him. Like, like, I want to wake up and go on Sunday, like, yes, there's a church service. Because <laughs> I spent over three, four months in my home, on my apartment, by myself. That's lame. Like, I'm super lame. And I love people. And I had to be in there. And now we're back in person. I'm like, this is so good. Like, I get to walk outside and see people. And an extrovert, if you're an extrovert, you're like, praise the Lord. If you're an introvert, you're like, nothing changed. <laughs> Life's been going on. I've been enjoying it. Meanwhile, I'm there and like I have my little dog and like I was doing crazy stuff with my dog. I was like, we were eating like cake together and seeing who could eat it the fastest. And I was recording that stuff like it's it's history and it's there. Like someday if I have kids, they're going to see like, what were you doing? I'm going to say, well, that was the season when God allowed us not to see people. <laughs> like I couldn't get a haircut and I get my haircut every three weeks <laughs> and, and I got to the like I get my haircut I'm like it's so good I'm talking to you <laughs> like why not go to church well we gotta wear a mask who cares someday hopefully they'll come off but we were already wearing masks how you doing? Oh, I'm good. No, I'm a mess. I'm broken. I got sin, addiction. <sighs> Center point. This is so good. That we get to gather. That we get to do life together. That we get to be in community. And, and, and even on sick days now, like almost every church, and if they haven't, I feel bad for them, but... They're online. So even if you have a sick day, like you can tune into Centerpoint now. Whereas before, if you had a sick day, we love you. But you weren't here. Like, this is our day, church. Like, God's given us so much opportunity to continue on mission for his glory. And, and I'm just looking at this and I'm going, oh man, like, uh, I believe God's about to do something spectacular. Like, the church might have been closed, but it wasn't. Because the church is more than a building. And, and God was doing a work in people's hearts and lives. Like, people were, were hitting their pillow at night going, I wonder what life's all about. Like, is there more? Like, why am I giving my life to this? Why am I wasting all my time doing this? Like, why do I watch so much Netflix? Isn't there more? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's more. And when God grips our heart and he gets us on mission, look out. 
and then look out because the enemy's going to show up. He's going to oppose it. So uh, I'll, clo I'll close with uh, this, this story of a lady who never spoke ill of anyone. So automatically it's a false story. So it's, it's made up. But uh, we'll just say this lady never spoke ill of anyone. And a friend told her, I believe that you would say something good even about the devil. Well, she replied, you certainly do have to admire his persistence. She's right. He's persistent. Center point, to finish our race, we must fight the good fight of faith by discerning and resisting Satan's many schemes. When Jesus uh, returns, oh, like, this is so good. So, so you come to church and people want to tell you about Jesus and here's what they'll tell you. They'll tell you this and it's all true. Like you're a sinner, you're lost, you're messed up, you're broken. But Jesus gave up heaven. He came to earth. He was born as a baby. He walked this earth. He lived the life that you could never live, right? And he grew in, in humility. He grew in grace. He grew in wisdom. And Jesus would never sin. And Jesus went into ministry at the age of 30 and Jesus started to go to those who were, who were rejected. They were on the outside side and he started to heal them he started to rescue them he started to share about how he is the redeemer how he is the savior and people were giving their lives to him and he was healing them he was casting out demons out of people he was restoring people to health and then jesus went to the cross and on the cross he died for your sins so you got any sin here today oh he carried that he carried the weight of it on his shoulders as he hung on the cross he would die he would die and he before dying he would call out to his father it is finished i've done the work not only that he was buried and then three days later he rose again and then you say this that's who you need and i agree with that like you need jesus if you don't know him you need him however we stop the gospel there but the gospel goes further it's so good you want to hear he rose he's in heaven he seated it right now at the right hand of the throne of God the Father, and he's chilling in his chair. His feet are up, resting on the enemy. The enemy is his footstool. One day, Jesus will get up off the throne. He will come back. The clouds will break open, and there King Jesus will be to fulfill his promise. Oh, I'm coming back. I'm wiping out disease. I'm wiping out sin. I'm wiping out Satan. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. That is the gospel in completion. He will come for you. Yeah, it's so good. So glad that we're excited about this. But we just stopped the gospel at the empty grave. No, hear me right now. You are a victor if you're found in Jesus. Sin has no reign. Sin has no dominion in your life because the Holy Spirit indwells you and the Holy Spirit is greater than that addiction. The Holy Spirit is greater than that hidden sin. The Holy Spirit is greater than your pride. The Holy Spirit reigns in your life and you're able to walk. You're able, get this, you're able, by the grace of God, to live for him, for his glory. You're able to open up the word of God and read and go, man, that was good. Oh, that was good for the soul. Like, you're able to come and to places like this and sing. <laughs> I don't sing. Uh, yeah, I, I don't sing well. But I can come here and sing. And here's the cool thing about this theater. It's like the sound when you sing, it goes dead sometimes. And they're like, I don't think anyone can hear me. And I'm over there and I'm singing. I'm like, yeah. Like in some churches, like you, you're heard. And some you're like, don't sing. <laughs> like in Winnipeg, and I can say this, I served with a pastor and he always stood up front. He was right into Jesus. He loved Jesus. But he threw the band off every week because he couldn't sing, but his voice just powered, and they were like, hey, Bruce, do you mind chilling? Like, bring it down a little. He's like, no way, I love Jesus. You got to learn to work with me. So even if you can't sing, sing! Ah, we get to praise Jesus. And, and some of you are like, I don't, like, heaven's presented this way. Like, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to, you know, have our harp and 
sit on the cloud and the ladies are going to have like male angels come and right and give them cream philadelphia cream cheese on bagels <laughs> and heaven's going to be so cool for them and and some guys are like i don't like harps i want to sit on cloud wait are we going to sing in heaven all the time for eternity <laughs> don't you love those questions have you ever thought about it? Like sometimes we, we, we are like, let's go to heaven. Some people are like, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Is heaven going to be like I'm thinking? Oh, hear me out. Heaven's more than uh, about a place. It's about a person. We get to be in the presence of God. So sometimes we'll sing. I believe sometimes we'll serve God in, in different ways that are, to our, our, really to our joy, etc. I, I don't think we're going to be singing 24-7. So now I brought some of you back, and you're like, but when praise time comes, we'll sing. <laughs> Just like we should be doing already. So, so we're about to close in song. I'm going to pray, and then you're going to sing. And you're going to sing like it's practice for heaven. And some of you are like, I don't sing. You will in heaven. So let's just picture that. That we're going to picture our amazing Savior who is going to come back for us one day. And those of us found in Christ, we're going to praise him. Okay? Uh, those of you here today and don't have relationship with Jesus, he wants to have a relationship with you. Hear me on this. He has not come to condemn you. No guilt, no shame. Jesus has come to rescue, rescue you, to save you. And then you live for his glory. And trust me, when you live for his glory, it brings joy to your life. Heavenly Father, you're so good to us. Thank you for defeating the enemy, Jesus. Thank you so much that you have triumphed over my flesh over the world and you have defeated like you've you've cast satan down satan and demonic forces have no power over the believer today thank you for that the only power he has is when we allow him to have these footholds in our lives so god i pray that because of the gospel they would just these chains would be shattered they'd be broken that we wouldn't walk a, walk around defeated but we'd walk around victorious like jesus fought the battle but not only fought it he won he defeated the enemy he reigns in heaven today like right now at the throne of jesus there is angels surrounding his throne just singing glory and holy to the lord to the king of kings to the prince of peace god may our praise never stop for that amazing savior your son jesus in his name we pray, amen.